Welcome to Discovering. Handcrafted is a common term here in the UP. I visited the shop of Beth Milner in Marquette for a look at some of the finest handcrafted jewelry you'll find anywhere. People have been telling me, oh, your jewelry is really the jewelry of the UP. It's a reflection of the area, and that is my main inspiration. Stick around. It's Monday night and time for Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. The call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. Streams, lakes, forests, and people of the UP make it one of the most beautiful places on the planet. In the middle of downtown Marquette, you'll find Beth Milner and her creative team busy replicating that beauty in the form of jewelry. Today I'm going to show you how I'll make a pendant that kind of features a Michigan greenstone and a little UP and a tree, and the UP is made of um, Upper Peninsula copper. So all of the parts start out as, as flat sheet metal or wire that make up these pieces. So what we're gonna start with is just cutting this piece of silver with the shear in the back room to kind of get this rectangle here that we'd like to start for the bottom of the pendant. So this is a sheet metal shear and when I first started I just did all of this with a little hand saw but now I have the luxury of a tool like this that can help me cut through the metal. And now we have a little bit of a rectangle there that we can use for the base of the pendant. So this is a little scrap piece of UP copper and I, I have a supply of white pine copper from the white pine mine which is really kind of nice to have pieces literally made of the UP. I basically design these, I draw something up and then I make something on the computer with that drawing and then I can glue this paper to a piece of metal in order to kind of have a template to follow as I'm sawing with the jeweler's saw. Even though I'm not gonna make this pendant here with the tree and the UP, I'm gonna kind of do a different design. I'm gonna cut that UP out of this one and then what's left I can use for a different piece that I like to make too. What's kind of cool about the jeweler's saw is it looks like a typical coping saw that would, you would use for woodworking, but the main difference of this saw is that the, there's no little hook at the end of the blade, so I can drill the tiniest little hole and thread this blade through, and I can cut out really, really fine shapes with the, the saw blade, and I actually use about eight different sizes of saw blade depending on how much detail or how thick the metal is too. And then kind of tighten the saw so it kind of twists until you get the blade to be a bit tighter. And this little thing is a vise, which really helps hold the metal. I kind of, this is one of my favorite processes working with the jeweler's saw. I think because it's difficult when you first learn it, it's not easy to kind of keep the saw blades straight or to, to kind of get the designs you're trying to make. Now I have a full-time assistant in the studio, Nina, who helps me make the jewelry and she might spend an entire day just cutting out little UPs, but we try to mix it up so it doesn't get too repetitive. And so I'll use that part for the piece we're making today. I'll show you how we solder down this little bezel that I make to the piece. And then we'll also solder the little UP on there as well. We hand fabricate all the settings for our Michigan stones right here in the studio. So it's not pre-made parts, it's all handmade parts, which is a little bit less typical in the main jewelry industry these days. So first I'm gonna apply some of this flux to our piece of silver. It's also a protectant so I don't get staining on the metal. So it kind of prevents oxides from forming on the surface of the silver, and it also helps our solder flow. Jewelry soldering is a lot different than plumber soldering. This is sort of a much higher temperature where we're not using a tin solder. It's mainly sterling silver in the solder, and it's over a thousand degrees. So I make a little ball of solder, and this is called pick soldering. There's lots of different methods. But then I have that inside of there, and I want a little bit of flux on the ball of solder too. And now I'm gonna heat it from below. And the solder really goes to where the heat is. So I'm trying to heat very evenly around the edge of this little bezel so that the solder flows all the way around. And I can tell by the look of the metal that it's getting really close to flowing. 
and there it goes. So now that little ball of solder has kind of flowed all the way around and joined that piece of metal to this metal. Next I'll put the little UP on, but I'm going to flow some solder onto it first. And now there's solder on the back of that piece. That's probably the, one of the trickiest things of soldering is placing your parts exactly where you want them without them moving around on you. And you'll see it just ever so slightly once it goes, it'll kind of drop down and it'll stick to the base. There we go. So now it, it, all of the metal is a bit discolored and you can see the copper looks kind of black. And then we take that and we actually dunk it in water. And but then we soak it in a solution of citric acid in water, which is kind of a natural pickling agent, which that'll be bring the metal back up to bright again. So this is what it comes out of the pickle looking like, um, but I've drawn a little tree on there with Sharpie. So that is kind of our next step. And, and it's a little bit backwards in the process because I want to put some leaves on this tree, um, but I need to put the leaves on before I do the sawing. Otherwise the sawing is going to kind of mess up the damping of the leaves and it'll make my tree look not like I intended. So these are my own homemade stamps that I use. They're just nails that I've spent some time filing and um, making the end into the tiniest little leaf to make sure I've got the leaf stem facing the right way. And I'm going to line it up with my drawing of a tree and we'll start stamping the leaves. There's a lot of pre-made stamps out in the world, but I, I kind of like to make my own stamps so they're unique to my pieces. Kind of stamped over it. And you can see the metal's getting a little bit of a curve to it, and that's because we're sort of stretching the metal where the stamp is hitting, and we'll kind of flatten that back out before we're done. And then we'll use a plastic hammer so we don't dent the metal to kind of get this curve back out of here. Maybe I'll put a little texture on it too. So I think I'm going to do a little bit of a sunburst on the edge of this piece. I like that texture because it kind of looks like the beams of light coming through the clouds when, when the sun is shining really bright. And so now we've kind of got leaves and the little tree, but the tree needs to be cut out yet. I like to cut those through the metal. Okay, I'm going to drill another little hole. And then we'll thread this blade through the tree trunk here. Go ahead and saw through. Silver is a little bit easier to cut than copper. Copper is just a smidge softer and so it feels a little sticky when you're cutting it. Once I'm done kind of cutting these out, you'll be able to, I'll take a little rubbing alcohol to get the marker off and you'll be able to see it a lot better. On the piece just to get the marker off. There's lots of finish work I'm not showing because that's the part that's boring and takes a long time usually. But So the little bale that I put on the top of almost all of my pendants is my own design. And so it's sort of this little hidden feature that if, if you kind of know my work at all, you, you usually recognize the bale as kind of the signature. So I'm going to add some flux to this piece again. And then I'm going to put a little solder on. I'm not going to use the same solder I did last time. So the first solder I used is a high melting point. The second solder I'm going to use is, is a medium solder, so it melts at a little lower temperature, so I don't risk the parts that I already did kind of coming off. So then I make sure everything's kind of still lined up, and we'll go ahead and heat this up again. The metal will get to a glowing temperature while I do this, but you might not see it because we have lights on, but um, it, it gets like a dull glowing red, so it's very hot. And I just have to keep a close eye on the, those little bits of solder up by the bale. So as I'm heating this, they uh, eventually will flow into the crevices where I've set them. So now the piece kind of has funny oxides again. Sometimes that looks cool. You say, oh, there's pink and yellow and all the colors, but that doesn't last and we want to clean it off because it's not nice against the body to kind of have that flux. So we'll put that one in the pickle again. So that one comes out all clean after it's been in the, in the pickle. Kind of a matte tone to the metal. I'm actually going to use one of these bristle discs, which is like a, a rubber wheel that's got grit embedded into it. Works really great when you got a lot of texture and things you're trying to get around. Most of the work we do is sanding. I'm skipping lots of it while we're on TV here, but there's, there's lots of sanding. So I started my um, business making jewelry back in 2007. So I went to Northern for art and design and metal smithing. I started at Northern thinking, oh, maybe I'll go for drawing. And then I ended up in a, in a jewelry making course and I was basically hooked. 
I really enjoy how this allows me to use my drawing skills to come up with designs. Then I bring those designs on the computer and I get to use the computer to kind of alter those designs. And then I get to bring it into the studio and actually make it in metal. I actually started by traveling around to music festivals and art shows. And I did shows like that for about five years. And so I didn't have the storefront, but I did have a website. And so I was savvy enough to kind of build my own online shop and, and allow people to purchase online. So sort of had an, um, enough space for my studio at home. And then I bought the shop here downtown and it, it was just me and one part-time helper. And now it's turned into me and a whole staff of six helping me run the operation with one full-time person in the studio. This is probably the most pivotal point in setting one of these stones because it, it, I wanted to fit. I spent a lot of time making that bezel to make sure that the stone would fit in there. The dental floss kind of lifts it up a little bit so it do, I can pull it back out, but that one's gonna fit really nice. And now I'm looking kind of at the wall of metal around it and I need to trim that down a little bit more so we're not hiding too much of the stone. You know, I learned a lot through going to art school and learning metalsmithing um, under Dale Weedig at Northern. And then the years after school, I've learned so much more only because of time and, and experience. And so, you know, with those basic groundwork of going to, to art school, it really helped me understand why I was making the work and, and what I wanted to make work about. But the years following, I've really honed my skills and my craftsmanship in the studio. And so I, I spend, you know, I do this full time. And in the first several years was a whole lot more than that. And, and I've got the luxury of having a whole staff that, that does all the work to keep our online presence up and our social media going and I really get to spend most of my time designing and making jewelry. This part sometimes takes a bit longer, but it really makes the stone look nicer to make sure that this is well prepared before we start locking it in there. One more little sanding and then we'll get on to setting the stone. Now that I'm, I feel like the height is the right height and I'm ready to put it in there, I'm not going to um, use the dental floss this time. I'll just put it in there. And then I like to make sure that it's sitting flat. And then next I'll use this bezel tool to set it. It's just a piece of steel that's kind of in a certain shape. Green stones are mainly found in the Keweenaw Peninsula and on Isle Royal, and they're actually Michigan State gem. And so not everybody knows that. They, they think, oh, the Petoskey stone, but it's our, it, our state gem is the Michigan green stone. Um, the green stones that I use are found up in the Keweenaw Peninsula by a couple who kind of is my secret source. They, they go out and they find the rocks and they cut and polish them and, and bring them to me and I, I purchase them um, from them. And I, th I think greenstones are rather beautiful. I, I like how in the really nice bright light you see all of their details and they have a, a nice sort of forest green to them with a turtle back pattern. Currently it is not legal to pick them up on Isle Royal. So they want to keep those natural resources around. But in the Keweenaw, if you find one, you can pick it up. And if you go up into the Keweenaw, a lot of the gift shops and, and little rock shops and off the beaten path jam places up in the Keweenaw will have greenstones as well. Gonna be a little bit more finish work around the the green stone to kind of smooth the tool marks that I made while setting the stone. Usually I'll do a little bit of a design on the back. You can see that the tree is cut through, so I oftentimes will en engrave some little hillsides on the back to make it a reversible pendant, which is really kind of fun. On the back they make it look like snow, and then on the front it's kind of summer. So I like to do things that show off the different seasons that we're all experiencing all the time too. And then next we'll go back to the patina station. So we're gonna take this piece. And I think I'm not going to submerge it because I don't want patina under the stone. But first I'll start by like painting in the little leaves. We'll put this in here to kind of get these leaves darker than the rest of it. Patina is kind of like an intentional tarnishing of the metal. So it's a sulfur solution and it reacts with the silver to kind of darken it. Some of you might have well water and your silver jewelry might darken because of the water. And if it's got a sulfur smell, that's why. And so what we're doing is, you know, intentionally darkening it in certain areas. And I, I like to do that with my pieces because I feel like they wear better that way. Like the low areas are what's going to tarnish first naturally just from it being exposed to light and air and, and different things in the environment. And so what we do is we'll, we'll actually just go ahead and patina um, the parts in advance and then take it off the high area so the upkeep is a lot easier for the person wearing the jewelry too. We can see it went from like a bright yellow to kind of, of a tan color. And so I want to put the patina on the rest of the silver too. So I'm going to try and apply it pretty evenly. I just thought we'd start with the leaves. You'll see the copper go dark immediately because that's what copper does. It tarnishes easily. And then I'm also going to do the back. Basically, we'll just get a nice sort of puddle of it on there. And it probably take like 10 minutes and it'll get nice and dark. 
So basically that just sits there for a little while until it gets to a nice color that we're hoping for. So what we'll do is we'll just set a timer and then I don't forget about it. Well, the leaves are darker than the rest of the pendant because we painted those in first with the patina solution. So it's kind of reacting more. And then the, the rest of the surface is, is very slowly kind of turning the same dark gray, but I wanted to make sure those leaves were definitely really dark because I'm going to take most of it off of the surface around them anyway. So I kind of just keep adding a little bit more to keep it dark essentially or to keep it from drying out because it'll kind of stop when it's dry. People always ask if we can keep the rainbow if they see that part of the process but it will just darken more over time so I try to make the pieces like they're going to wear as you're wearing them through the years. Kind of rinse that off and we can see that it's pretty dark. It's kind of got a bluish look to it. And then next we'll take it over to the steel wool and kind of clean some of that off the surface. So then we'll use a piece of steel wool to kind of remove some of the patina and show off the fact that that little UP is actually copper and not just dark gray metal. And kind of take out some of the irregularity of the patina. So that kind of takes most of the patina off but leaves it a little bit dull. And then we'll kind of rub with one of these to kind of bring some of the shine back up. I kind of like to have pieces that aren't too shiny, that they really kind of speak to the aesthetic of the UP. I think most of the people here, they kind of want something that reflects why they're here, and that's the beauty of nature and what's surrounding us and what we all appreciate. So I find that the people who like my work are the people who really love the natural environment and want to show off what they love. And so a lot of the pieces we make are inspired by specific places. And so we've got kind of my signature tree design and this, the stone setting. Yeah, people oftentimes like the, the pieces with the trees to represent family or sort of a significant milestone in life too, which is kind of nice. And, you know, there's a process in the office that happens after we do all of our handwork in the studio. And so they'll take pictures and they'll edit all the photos and they'll make an online listing for our online store. And then these would be available um, over the internet or in the shop here in a few months. But if you call and you want this particular pendant, we could make a, an exception and get it to you before it's actually released. These are just an, a selection to kind of show off the variety of work that we do. So something that's really popular is our pendants with the UP, made of that UP copper as well. We do a lot of designs with Lake Superior on them, so there's a lot of lake lovers out there and that's got that same texture we just used on the piece we made in the demonstration, which I feel like brings a lot of light into the design and I like that a lot. This one's inspired by Brockway Mountain up in the Keweenaw Peninsula. I wanted to kind of do a piece that showed off one of my favorite places up there, which if you've ever been to Copper Harbor, you have to go to Brockway Mountain. And then the back here is engraved with a sort of snowy scene again, so that sort of reversible feature that people like. This piece here has a Lake Superior agate, and that's a pretty unique agate, and it's got UP copper on the bottom and a big wave. This design was inspired by the big um, storm we had on Lake Superior in the fall, and I wanted to make a piece that really showed the waves turning up the rocks, because that's what happened on our shoreline here in Marquette. It was completely different after that, and I wanted to show off kind of the power and strength of Lake Superior. This one's inspired by Presque Isle Park, and so some of them aren't literal representations of a certain view from the park, but more of our feeling of it, and so it's kind of a, a peninsula going off into the water, and oftentimes I'll put two trees on the pieces because it, it makes me think of two people kind of standing there together, enjoying the views. This one's also a two-sided piece with a little hill on the back. We do a variety of engagement rings and wedding bands. So this one is a rose gold. So even though I work with a lot of copper, they don't really work so well for rings. Copper can turn your hands green. A great alternative is rose gold, which is also more durable. And so this has a little rustic gray diamond set with rose gold, a little bit less traditional, but still really beautiful. Kind of perfect for that person who's outdoors and naturey, but um, doesn't really consider themselves someone who likes a lot of sparkle and bling. We also do a variety of fundraiser pieces. And so each year we put a call out for people to apply to be part of our fundraiser program. And we pick organizations based on their, their best applications that they submit to us. And this one was designed for the Known Cayman on Trail Network. And so how, how that works is someone can come in and purchase this piece and we would donate $50 over to the, the Known Cayman on Trail Network. So we really think community involvement is very important too. This one here is inspired by the Chocolate River and this is kind of the bigger version of the same pendant and they're both um, two-sided. This one has sort of an engraving and this one's just simple with the tree on the back. 
We find that people that live along or near some of these areas or had a significant experience there really enjoy kind of having a gift they can give to someone that represents a nice canoe trip that they took or where grandma's house used to be. And, you know, lately people have been telling me, oh, your jewelry is really the jewelry of the UP. It's a reflection of the area. And that is my main inspiration is all the place, beautiful places we go. And I try to sort of represent them in metal, either in an abstract way or literal. And then over the winter here, I, I did a, a big series called the Wonderland series. And this one's featuring a copper agate, which is, is a very rare UP stone. So it's a Lake Superior agate that actually forms with copper in it, which is um, pretty unique. And that's another reversible design where you can flip it and have the snow on the back. I wanted to do something that was really artistic and not necessarily something I imagined people wearing. And I submitted this to the Halstead Design Challenge, which is a supply company. And they, they basically have a kit that you buy and you have to use what's in the kit and then you have to use a found object. So this piece is, is using all these parts, but up in the treetops, that's actually UP float copper. So I wanted to kind of show a little bit of um, the UP off since this is a national competition. And then I wanted to do something with um, movement, which is part of the requirement. And so this piece spins, and while it spins, you get a rabbit jumping or running, essentially, on the hillside. So this is much more elaborate than most of the work in the store. Um, but it kind of shows the level that we can create at um, with enough time. This design competition, I'm working on these pieces that are basically inspired by the first forms of animation. And so I wanted to kind of have something a little more approachable. Now this doesn't have the patina yet, so it's not showing as beautiful as it will. But these pieces are meant to spin, and what you'll see is the picture on this side of the little mouse, and then there's an owl on the other side, and as we spin it, they'll superimpose into one design. And then I designed these to have a little lock at the top, so if you want to just be a, a mouse or if you want to be an owl, you can put whichever side out to the front that you, you kind of want to show. Those will look a lot better once they have their patina because it'll pop and show the details a little bit better. Coming up on March 22nd, it's the 40th Annual Marquette Chapter Ducks Unlimited Banquet for Waterfall and Wetlands Conservation. The banquet will be held in the Great Lakes Room at the Northern Michigan University Center. Last year, there were over $20,000 in guns and prizes, so get your tickets now. Email them or visit their Facebook page for more information. That's it for tonight. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right back here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. <laughs>